Well, welcome everybody to uh, this latest podcast from Poker Media Australia. Uh, we've got some very special guests today and we're really looking forward to this podcast. Plenty happening in the Australian poker scene at the moment. Uh, who knew COVID was even happening? Everything's rolling along nicely, especially north of the border at the moment up in Queensland. But before we get to that, Landon, uh, good to see you, mate. How are you going? Great to see you too, Ben. I'll tell you what, it's going absolutely gangbusters here in the Sunshine State. Uh, in fact, pretty much anywhere where we're sort of more or less back to a COVID normal. Uh, I myself have been travelling uh, extensively throughout South Australia and Queensland covering events just within these first two months alone. We've had the Southern Poker Tour, the Australian Poker Tour, but more importantly, we're going to have a couple of uh, big events that have happened recently, which we're about to discuss with our two very, very special guests. Both of you, of course, no, need no introduction to the Australian poker scene, but uh, Jackie Glazier, great to have you on. First time on the PMA podcast. I've been trying to get you on for a while, but you know, you're a very busy lady. You're uh, nagging, you're nagging, finally <laughs> paid off, yes. Of course, you are the first lady of Australian poker, and I mean, your resume is too long for me to read out. WSOP bracelet winner, uh, very successful in your own right, of course, representing the Australian Poker League and uh, and recently you're a Queenslander too, which I never thought would happen. But, uh, you know, how, how's that move been? Last year you moved up from Melbourne to Queensland and it looks, from what I can see on, on uh, you know, on Facebook and, and Instagram, it looks like you're having a great time up there. Yeah, it's gorgeous up here. We are, don't regret the move at all. I have to admit I struggle finding a, still struggle finding a good coffee up here. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Queen Clanders. Melbourne definitely has better coffee. But, um, yeah, I found a few little places. But other than that, it hasn't been too much, um, too much of a hurdle getting up here. It looks like it's all uh, surf, and, surf and sand up there for you, Jackie, so far. Yeah, I'm not much of a surfer, but um, I kind of look the part, but I, it's just not, yeah, I have no um, coordination or, or balance, so that's, like, not for me. Maybe bodyboarding I'd be okay at, but, yeah, not surfing. <laughs> Timing was good too, Jackie. I mean, you, you just managed to avoid the lockdown last year and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure it was probably pretty tough for you. We weren't able to see family for a while. I mean, what was it like for you in the, I mean, you just moved up to Queensland and you, and you couldn't go back down and visit for a five or six month period that must have been a bit challenging at the time yeah it was really hard I, I packed a bag for three days and came up here to visit ja visit Jamie um he had a work exemption and then I got an exemption it was in between the two Melbourne lockdowns to come up and see him during that time so I came up here and with my bag packed for three days and we looked at a house and and then we kind of bought it on the spot and then the second outbreak happened in Melbourne and we kind of just kept holding off going home to pack up the house because we didn't want to quarantine coming back as well. And in the end, we just never returned. It just got, yeah, too hard and we just paid people to pack up the house and, and do everything. We sold the house remotely. Like just my sister gave the real estate agent a key and, yeah, never went back. I never got to say goodbye to one, anyone either. Like they thought I was leaving for three days and then I just never returned. Yeah. It makes you feel better. I have a friend who went to Mongolia with his wife for seven days early last year and he's still there now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's worse, yeah. Uh, Joel, uh, awesome to have you on as well. And, wow, what an eventful um, year for you as well. I mean, you, we were sort of wondering what was happening with Crown Poker and you, you popped up with the APL. Uh, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about this more at length, but just run us through how this came to be. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, good to be here. Um, yeah, it was a fairly strange kind of world as it is these days in melbourne crown closed its doors on the 23rd of march last year and we were all stood down basically indefinitely and then um they reopened to an extent in mid to late october but with a 50 percent capacity rule across the complex unfortunately that didn't include poker and a few other you know traditionally low earning kind of games so Leading into, into Christmas and New Year, I was sort of filled with a bit of uncertainty and, and that's sort of um, sort of what led me, sort of indirectly kind of led me in a different direction, you know, and um, yeah, so very early in the New Year, late, probably mid to late Jan, I sort of made a bit of a conscious decision that the uncertainty wasn't for me, the uncertainty around international travel, um, even you know, changing management, changing focus. Basically, I sort of saw it as, you know, rebuilding an empire, if you like, 
and without even a start date set at that point. So I sort of thought, well, it's it's time for a change and it's time to, you know, put a bit of a full stop on the on the Crown career and try something new. I just, um, I, I will grow you too, Joel, a bit more on the whole Crown thing. I'm just interested in what, you know, what the future holds for yeah. Crown Melbourne yeah, and absolutely. the Crown Poker Room. But, um, you know, as you say, I mean, the, just the, the sight of, you know, going into Crown and the Crown Poker Room is not the Crown yeah. Poker Room anymore is a little unusual. And, of course, we would have had the Aussie Millions recently. I mean, has it been emotionally a, bit, a little bit tough for you to sort of see, I mean, 12 months ago, we were all talking about the great Aussie Millions we just had and now, you know, we don't know when the next one will be. Um, yeah, it was. It was really tough, actually. It was, I understand or I understood the Crown mindset. You know, Crown were, were thrown into a situation like everyone else in Victoria was was out of their control. Once they got the go-ahead to reopen, they were under strict capacity rules. And all of a sudden, if you can only, only allow 50% capacity in, well, it's common sense that you direct them towards a higher earning product. So, there was a lot of conspiracy theories being thrown around and it was, you know, to my knowledge, it was as simple as channelling players or channelling patrons towards high limit games um, and high yielding games and throw in the fact that Crown had to pretty much on the fly space out their existing products like never before. And suddenly the Vegas room where the poker room was located just became too valuable a real estate area to, to ignore. So the poker tables came out, the offerings that they'd prioritised, the blackjacks and roulettes had gone in, and that's sort of where poker sat. Late in the year, I, I was sort of pretty keen to get back in there and at least sort of plan for a reopening, however that might look and whenever that might be. And, and I think... I don't think it's neglect as such. I think it's just that it's so far down the list of Crown's priorities at the moment that they were happy to have to have me stay at home in the in the meantime. And eventually what starts as a, a little adventure and a little holiday becomes fairly tedious after about ten months. So yeah, that was the um the cue to, to make a little quiet exit out the back door and potentially, you know, find something else outside of the poker industry. But of course, that didn't eventuate, but that's okay. But yeah, that was the the cue to leave anyway. Um, Lando, you you and I have spoken a lot about the fact that you know no Aussie Millions this year, but that's you know I mean you've been on the scene at a lot of these events uh, traveling around the country, as you said. But what what has, it really has done is these um, you know more I guess the, you call them pub you know the pub poker, and, and I guess they're more than that these days. But you know Australian Poker League, Australian Poker Tour, all these smaller leagues around the country too have taken this opportunity and, of course, the APL is is no different launching its own tour. So, I mean, Lando, what have you, uh, being on the ground, I mean, have you sort of seen this sense of excitement coming up through the, you know, through the growing leagues and the growing ranks? Absolutely. What we're seeing right now is a seismic shift in market control going back to these major pub leagues, uh, specifically the APL, APT and the WPT League. So what we're seeing now is this evolution of mid-tier series, uh, that have been hosted in, in major venues, particularly down the eastern seaboard. Of course, the APL up until now have uh, not been able to uh, to venture into that particular area of the market. But um, I had the uh, honour and the privilege of being part of the, uh, the media coverage there for their most recent se- or their inaugural series rather at uh, Southport Sharks. I just want to uh, touch back with uh, Jackie for just a moment. A little birdie told me that uh, you had a little bit of a hand in getting Joel on board with the APL. Are you able to tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, maybe I, I nudged it that way a bit. Um, I, I knew that there wasn't much future for poker and then I was like, we all know what a valuable resource of information and knowledge and expertise Joel has and I thought, I wonder what he's doing. Like, it would just be such a waste for him just to be put on the gaming floor somewhere else. And so, yeah, I did kind of throw out the suggestion that possibly we, it might be a great opportunity for us. COVID, you know, has affected so many businesses, but it also creates opportunities as well. So we're, we're super happy to have him on board. Hey, Joel, do you want to tell us a little bit about your new role, um, you know, what you'll be doing? And also, that I guess that leads into the new initiatives of the APL and particularly the, the new poker tour. Can, can you talk us through uh, all of that? Yeah, absolutely. So my official title is um, APL Director of Major Events. So basically, my 
previous knowledge of the APL is similar to everyone else's. They're arguably the leaders at that grassroots level. They have however many hundred thousand players that, you know, uh, born and bred APL and play in their favourite venues around the country nonstop. And it was with the, the casino uncertainty across the country, as the other tours were probably first to jump and APL was close behind saying, we want to attract that that mid-level and that higher tier player. And what that does is ideally gives you the best of both worlds. You're still servicing your $60 and $80, $80 kind of players in, an, in that big event environment, but you're also attracting that, you know, the mid-level and the higher tier players as well. And ideally you've got the best of both running concurrently. So that's where I come in. As I said, I think APL is probably the market leaders in having access to the lower limit players and, and, a lot of those players have shown incredible loyalty over the years and, you know, playing APL venues. Some of them, guys I was talking to in Queensland recently, Some this guy's playing APL events five nights a week. So there's no issue with, with that base level. But ideally, I can come in and introduce the next level and the next level and the next level. And ideally, we're, we're playing a, a $60 tournament alongside a you know a $200 freeze out with a $500 six max and a 3K high roller all running concurrently in a world-class venue. So that's my role. My role is to upsell it and upscale it, if you like, and, and try and sort of firmly plan APL in this, in this new world of, of poker tour events. And, of course, the APL Poker Tour is, you know, a big step in that direction as well. Yeah, so basically APL Poker Tour and APL Million will come under my little world of control. So the APL Poker Tour kicked off at Southport last week on the Gold Coast. We've got events scheduled in Victoria, in South Australia, in New South Wales. And anyone that went anywhere near the APL Million last year at Star Sydney, the numbers reached were just astronomical. And that's going to fall under under my little portfolio as well. So, arguably the biggest tournament series outside of a casino run series. So APL aren't strangers to tournament series, you know. But we we really needed someone on board that could really position us with those mid tier to the higher tier. We kind of had a big gap between the league and then the APL moon, um, and we wanted to fill that. And as far as running big poker tournaments i mean we are the leaders in that as well you know i think people go oh apl you know it's a league base but we we've we've got a very good proven track record for for having very successful tournament series the apl million no one's come close to it as far as outside of casino run games so jackie and joel i want to pitch this question to both of you of course the weekend at southport sharks was immensely successful and i certainly think it changed a lot of people's perception and exceeded a lot of people's expectations what's the feedback been like since everything's wrapped up there i've had some great positive feedback we're actually a team that will listen to our players as well at the end of the day we actually want to create a product that the players want So we've reached out to people to give us feedback on what they enjoyed about the series, what they didn't enjoy, and in turn we take that on board and we'll make tweaks as we go to have bigger and better series and and actually be be providing products that the, the players want. So while the feedback has been overwhelmingly positive, any criticism about any of the structures or what's on the schedule, we listen to all that. And and at the end of the day, APL is about the players. It's a really good point. You know, there's, I've, I've always said that the majority of my feedback that genuinely gets actioned in future series has come from players. Because at the end of the day, there's a business mindset to an extent, but if you push that too hard and no one turns up, then no one wins, you know. So it's the player feedback that I seek. And I wasn't surprised how accessible and how approachable Jackie is in that environment. She's got a queue going out the door of people ready to give opinions and, you know, give positive and negative feedback. But I was surprised how many people came up to me. I got introduced a couple of times and whatnot, which was fine, but I was still surprised that there was a a steady stream of people ready to say, I don't like APL, this is what you should do, or I love APL, but this needs tweaking or everything in between, you know. And it's funny just walking away from Southport with endless notes and observations that overall the series was run really, really well, but it's a starting point. 
you know, and we're going to be constantly evolving to ensure that we provide the best possible product along the way. So, so what do you see as sort of the main little areas you can you can improve on for the upcoming series? Um, look, we're still I, I, we're still working on getting the best of all worlds. I think we need you basically the the way I write a schedule is basically to plot a path for different levels of player. You know, so I imagine a five hundred dollar buy in player, and I sort of plot his path path from start to finish. Obviously, you've got that sixty to eighty dollar market, and then you've got the high rollers and beyond. I thought the Queensland series was a really good start. We made some changes on the fly by, you know, a couple of sort of late registration alterations and a couple of last minute satellites that we probably omitted initially that shouldn't have been. But it's a really good platform to build from, and I, I think there's not too many changes needed moving forward. I think we can try and accommodate all levels of player with all different kinds of poker offerings. And then ideally it's just a matter of tweaking after that. And there were tournaments too that we thought would get really large numbers because they were lower buy-ins. You know, we had like a $35 mm. tournament. We thought that's going to be massive. Mm. It's going to appeal mm. to that real grassroots player. That, But that that didn't really get the numbers that we were anticipating. But then the bigger yeah. buy-in ones with, you know, some great structures really were the most popular. So, like, you you have a look at the numbers that come from the entries and, and we can tweak from that as well. We don't always require player feedback. It's obviously there on paper what's been popular and what hasn't. Just on that too, sorry, Ben, I think one of the reasons the bottom end tournaments fell a little bit flat is, is the creation of PTCs, the Poker Tour Credits. The APL's spent over 12 months flooding the market with poker tour credits that can be used dollar for dollar as tournament entries. And it's basically like, you know, hundreds of thousands of little satellite tickets in play. And what what we saw is the players that were expecting to sort of find their way into the $35 and the $50 bracket are turning up with a fistful of poker tour credits and saying, I've got 175 or 225, what can I play? And actually being sold, you know, almost upsold into a $250 or $275 tournament as a result because they're getting discounted entries. So that was something that was really pleasing, the uptake of the PTCs and how they were received. At so, the end of the day, we're literally having these tournaments that are, are filled with people buying in directly plus pretty much using the Poker Tour credits. We essentially have satellite um, winners coming in and a lot of them as well so it does create for a very diverse field which is great as well and it makes it accessible to um, everyone's budget. Would it also be fair to say that in relation to these smaller buy-in tournaments not being as popular as the bigger buy-in tournaments uh, would that be also because you have so many of those buy-in price points so readily available during the weekly events? I think that's fair yeah I, I think the idea of creating an event is to basically, it, it, it's it's a regular tournament on steroids, if you like. It's a better environment, better structures, just bigger and better across the board. And I think what happens, and I found it over the last few years at Crown as well, is a split second someone walks into that environment, their chest is out, and, you know, they're full of confidence and they're almost ready to take that next step and throw in the fact that a lot of surprising amount of players had these poker tour credits that we're allowing them discounted entries into tournaments they may not usually play. And, yeah, suddenly you've pretty much upshifted everyone one level, you know. So, yeah, it's a changing environment for sure. It used to be, I think, quite a, you mentioned it before, a pretty big gap between, you know, I guess you had you only really had lower tier and casino level of tournaments. And this is this mid-tier that was missing before. Are you seeing familiar faces from, you know, I guess that used to play at Crown that are now starting to play in, in these events? I am, yeah, 100%. And more so I'm ready for the onslaught that's going to be Victoria being my town and obviously the home of Crown. You've got endless people, you know, having withdrawal symptoms through with the casino uncertainty, but already I'm getting feedback from players that have seen the structures, have seen the schedule and are up and about that on its merits. You know, it's very easy to get the pity vote at the moment. There's no crown, so we'll lower ourselves. And it's not that at all. I think the 
the level of, you know, two to three to five hundred dollar buy-in tournaments that are around at the moment and the quality of the structures and and the offering in general means that players are actually almost deliberately shifting, if you know what I mean, as opposed to just playing because there's nothing else. And the feedback for the up some of the upcoming schedules has been really positive, which is really, really promising. And yeah, the fact that there's that two to five hundred dollar tournament in mainstream venues is unheard of, really. And it's it's the present we live in, and hopefully it continues for the future as well. What I'm particularly interested in seeing in this upcoming series, and I hope it happens, touch wood that um, the restrictions are lifted, so we can get um, our friends from Queensland down to Victoria as well. Uh, Jackie, I'm sure you're very familiar with the uh, this younger generation of players that are coming through: uh, William Wong, Aroha Nagata, Josh Norvok. Sam Adams, just to name a few. I'd be particularly excited to see them uh, come down. But, of course, uh, we should also touch on the last two major events that you had up far north, uh, the North Queensland Classic that just wrapped up before the APLPT and the Ville 600. Tell us a little bit more about uh, what makes these particular events so special. For starters, the the ones up at Townsville are true destination events as well. So they are places where, you know, if you get knocked out of a tournament, like kind of you I mean you care obviously but if there's a pool party going on and the the bars open the swim up bar like it's not such a bad environment to be in and then there is a casino on site up there as well so you know there's a lot of fun goes on off the tables up there which makes it a great event but I think too the atmosphere and the people really make those events as well and they're they're well run Alan's been doing a, a great job um, up there and and he really does care about his players so um yeah I, that's my view on it I love going up there Joel you went for the first time this time yeah first time visitor not long ago yeah and it's I won a mean, tournament and I won a tournament <laughs> finally finally got a winner's photo I was happy with yeah, that yeah <laughs> what your first tournament as APL tournament director Joel that- it is I was wow. one from I was one from one until yeah, I played the teams event. Now I'm at fifty percent. You wanted to follow on from what Joel was talking about before about you know that this mid tier and you've got players that are starting to play these events now that used to play you know at Crown and and Sydney and and you know Melbourne and and that sort of thing. What about from the the players now that used to play you know at Crown and and Star and all that. But what about from the the player experience? I mean, you've played everywhere around the world. You've you've got a, a WSOP bracelet. You, you go to or used to go to Vegas every year. Um, so, you know, you're used to that top-end experience. How about, I mean, from the player experience uh, of, of these events now, I mean, you must have seen this incredible improvement over the past few years. Yeah, I mean, we're not playing like some, you know, dingy room in an RSL. Like we actually are picking venues that, you know, do create more of an experience for players. You know, we're working on, you know, having posters and things around the room that do kind of bring that atmosphere as well. Our tables that we're bringing in, you know, we're, we're, we're spending money on things that are just more aesthetic, you know, as well um, as functional. I mean, a great table is always appreciated by any player but if it looks like something special you've got a final table as well that you're sitting around that that looks great like they're the things that that you experience in places like Vegas or a casino so we are heavily invested in in creating the best possible experience for our players saying that you know we've just come in at this mid-tier we we're working on it like just I think we just want everyone to just hang in there with us while we make necessary changes as we go along. Give us six months and everyone will be super surprised where we are. I've got a, I mean, you mentioned talking about APL Million. Uh, I was actually in Star, uh, the former venue of APL Million, and, and hopefully one day in the future again, two weeks ago. And, and same as Crown, that the room is no longer a poker room. It looks like a bit of a storage space at the moment. It's a bit sad to see, but it is what it is. What is happening with APL Million this year, Joel? Can you sort of tell us uh, a bit about sort of venue or what the plans are at this stage? Uh, I can tell you a little bit. We're we're still working towards March 2022 for APL Million at Star Sydney. We've got a couple of little things in the sort of melting pot at the moment to try and launch something this year. Not at liberty to discuss just yet, not quite confirmed, but stay tuned because all's looking good for some level of APL million this year with a bit of luck. But absolutely still working towards March 2022 in Sydney as well. And you probably can talk a bit more about the next couple of events for APL Poker Tour. What can we expect from those? 
Melbourne's coming up first week of March, 4th to the 7th of March, and we've already run a main event flight already. We had a couple of interruptions with the, the snap COVID lockdown, but as I said, that's life in Melbourne at the moment. We're growing accustomed to it, unfortunately. So $150 main with a 150K guarantee. I'd expect somewhere between 14 and 1,800 runners for that. It's just enormous, and the feedback has been strong, and we're even to the point where we're making a few last-minute schedule changes, which is not ideal, but the, the end result will be far, far better and a bigger offering for players. So we've been running a few day ones outside of the actual tournament venue during those dates. So in the lead up, you can be going somewhere a little bit more local and trying to get a bag before the actual tournament series comes comes on. So um, I think that that will create a big field as well. It just It makes it more accessible to players to keep trying to bag up for day two. And obviously you can do it at the venue as well. And I should ask on behalf of uh, New South Wales players, because I've had a few false starts trying to get up to Queensland because of COVID. But, uh, you know, when you do come down to New South Wales, uh, are there any sort of anything confirmed? Yeah, for soon. Um, yeah. New South Wales, I'm hoping to have confirmed this week. It's looking like late April, early May. Tentative dates at the moment, 27th of April to the 2nd of May, and that's the plan. And, yeah, I think it's no secret that Sydney has got as big a poker market as anywhere else in the country, and I'm really excited to see what we can achieve there. And, as I said, we're, we're aiming for late April, and, and, yeah, all's on track. Oh, great to see you, Jackie. Great to see you again, uh, hopefully in person sometime soon. Yeah, hopefully. We'll have a beer together. Eventually. And uh, for everybody else, we'll see you next time.